On today's episode of Locked On A's, I did some research over the weekend and found a couple of little flaws and a couple of guys on the A's. I'm giving out some homework assignments, so let's get into it. You are Locked On A's. Your daily Oakland A's podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. How's it going, A's fans? And welcome to episode 364 of the Locked On A's podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, noted baseball fan, Jason Burke. And on today's episode, again, I spent some time poking around baseball savant over the weekend, and I found three players with holes that I want to see them improve upon this off season. But before I get into anything else, uh, make sure, or I mean, thank you for listening to Locked On A's first and making this your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube page, um, wherever you like. Finding YouTube pages, go there, I guess. Um, leave us comments, uh, comment below, and also uh, like us, do all those things. Follow us on social media at Locked On A's on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at ByJasonB on Twitter and the Spotify Green Room app. If you guys have any questions for us, please send those to LockedOnAthletics at gmail.com. So let's get into what I saw. And first up, I am talking about Ramon Laureano. Uh, whose suspension will last into the first month of the 2022 season. So he's going to have some extra time to work on these things. Uh, that that said, my guess is that no matter how the offseason goes, he's probably going to be on the A's in 2022. He's, he's entering his first year of arbitration. He's projected to get like $2.8 million. So not a huge expenditure for somebody like Ramon Laureano. And if the A's sell everybody off, I think that he would be there. If they keep everybody, obviously, I think that Ramon Laureano would be there. So therefore, I'm talking about Ramon Laureano first. And when I say I want him to work on something, you're probably thinking that it's going to be something to do with his bat and with his offensive performance. And while I would like him to improve upon his strikeout rate, uh, which was 25.9 in 2021, uh, I would like to see that drop a little bit. I would also like to see him get on base a little bit more than the 317 clip that he posted. I'm actually going to suggest that he improve his defense a little bit. And I, I know that sounds wild. Stick with me. It, it, it makes sense according to the metrics. So let's get into it. I know that he's a gold glove caliber defender and he put up three defensive runs saved in 2021, according to fan graphs, but according to baseball savant, there is one area that he can work on, and that is route running. That's not just for wide receivers in football. It is also for outfielders as they track baseballs and catch them. That's route running. That's that's all that I want him to improve on. Because according to outs above average, which is on baseball's fun, Loreano ranked 75th among big league outfielders with you know enough playing time. And that is despite being in the top three outfielders, qualified outfielders in reaction time. So he's getting a great jump and he's also uh, top 15 in feet covered. So he can get a good jump. He can cover a lot of ground, but he's still ranked 75th. And that is because his route running is not the most efficient. His route to the baseball isn't direct. And what he grades closely very closely. I think he had a negative two outs above average. Andrew Vaughn of the Chicago White Sox, who was a first baseman by trade, got a negative three. So he's very, very close to Andrew Vaughn and not near the top of the outs above average leaderboard, even though he covers six more feet per second than Andrew Vaughn. But Vaughn runs better, better routes. That's, that's all it is. He just has a more direct path and that makes him an adequate defender in the outfield. Uh, nobody would say that he's great, but he's apparently okay according to the metrics. So Ramon has all of the tools in the world and it's likely because of these tools that he's able to make so many highlight plays. He's got that great arm and we're not talking about his arm. We're just talking about how he gets to the baseballs. Uh, and it's because he's of all of those tools that he's able to be just looks so great as a defender, even with a flawed process in his route running. He made just 
43.4% of the plays with a catch probability between zero and 90%. So basically impossible to very likely. Uh, he made 43.4% of those plays. By comparison, the Tampa Bay Rays have three outfielders, th an entire outfield's worth of outfielders that had uh, catch probabilities, uh, th those same zero to 90s. They had a 66.7% on those same baseballs. So uh, over 23% better than Ramon Laureano, who is arguably one of the A's better ones uh, just by look and feel. But the, the Rays have an entire outfield of way better than Ramon Laureano's, according to this metric. And in a fairly limited sample, Seth Brown, I know that we talk about his strikeouts and he hits home runs and I, I gave him some other things to work on. But uh, Seth Brown caught 64.1% of those baseballs, uh, of those zero to 90 percent catch probability balls and that ranked him 12th in all of baseball so he's a pretty good defender mark canna had a 52.8 and starling Marte had a 48.6 so according to this outs above average metric loriano may have actually been the a's fourth best defensive outfielder in terms of catching balls there's a lot more that goes into defense than just catching the balls but if he improved upon that he would be the Kevin Kiermeyer of baseball. He's already pretty close. It's just the route running. He's got the arm. He's got everything else. He's got the jump. He can cover ground. It's just getting to those baseballs, making those high probability plays more often is what he needs to improve upon. Chad Pender, uh, he had a 38% and a uh, uh, on the same metric. And Stephen Biscotti had a 28.6. And those are the only two A's that played enough outfield to garner a place on the leaderboards that were behind Ramon Laureano. And we know that Chad Pender makes good plays. He's got a pretty decent arm. Steven Scotty, I think that that, uh, that makes sense. The 28.6 right there. So th there is room to improve is all I'm trying to say here. Sky Bolt and Tony Kemp uh, with their limited sample sizes, they were not qualified outfielders, but they were also above Ramon Laureano. So uh, of guys that played at all, Ramon Laureano was like sixth. I'm just saying there's room to improve. That's all that I'm saying here. And does this mean that he's a bad defender? Not at all. No. But as the ways to track performance evolve, so do the ways to evaluate players. And that offers them a chance to improve upon their perceived flaws. And that's all that I'm doing is take more direct routes to the ball. You can work on that in an offseason. I feel like that is achievable. And you can act upon that in the 2022 season. So that's what I want to see from Ramon Laureano. And with an outfield of Seth Brown, Ramon Laureano, and likely TBD or to be determined uh, as the everyday third option, the A's outfield has a chance to be pretty good next year defensively at the very least, no matter what the offseason holds, because I'm pretty sure those two guys are going to be here. And then whoever else is playing the right field or left, field, whichever spot they want to, you know, leave open. I'm pretty sure that they'd have a pretty good defensive outfield if they want to go that way. And to help them reach some of that potential, I'm giving Seth Brown some homework too. So stay locked in with Locked On A's and I'll be right back. Does this sound familiar? You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows. You're watching sports highlights on your phone and you've got your neighbor's best friends log in for the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all of that entertainment that you love without the hassle and that great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings you all the live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion. Get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. All right, so with that, how's it going, YouTube people? Uh, it is Monday afternoon as I'm recording this. Again, new job getting into the, the flow of things and recording at different times of day. Now, it's not going to be always at night to get you guys ready. So I uh, apologize, wasn't up earlier, but hey, we're here now. So that's fun. Um, coming up this week, I'm going to be talking. Oh, I've got two more guys to go over today. Coming up this week, I'm going to be talking a little bit about, I, I got this new, new thing called Fat Tuesday, and it's going to be free agents and trades. And I go over them on Tuesday. So how can the A's improve? by going after the free agent market and the trade market 
and I talk about that on Tuesday. It's called Fat Tuesday. I thought it was clever. So that's that's Tuesdays for you. And then on Wednesday, uh, actually, as I'm recording this, uh, uh, MLB Trade Rumors just released their arbitration estimates for 300 players. And so I'm gonna. I haven't looked at those yet, uh, but I, I was, I'm going to assume that I can try and use that in preparation for putting an NA's roster together. So that's what I'm going to be doing on Wednesday, I believe. And then Thursday, Friday, hey, we'll figure it out because it's still early. <laughs> but that is the plan for the week. And you guys on YouTube, you get to hear it here first. So thank you. But let's get back into this. <clears throat> Welcome back to the Lockdown Ace Podcast. If you guys are enjoying the show, make sure to hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts. Follow us on YouTube. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, like, comment, subscribe, do all of the things that you need to do over on YouTube. And also thank you guys for making Locked On A's your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. And make sure to follow us on social media at Locked On A's on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at by Jason B on Twitter and the Spotify Green Room app. If you guys have any questions for us, please send those to LockedOnAthletics at gmail.com. Now let's turn our attention to Seth Brown. We know he can play outfield defense. I've talked about it a few times on the podcast, but as his 214 batting average and 274 on base percentage or on base average uh, suggest, he needs to do a little bit more at the plate besides hitting home runs, which he did at the same rate as Matt Olson in 2021. So he can hit, he has power. He can hit the long ball, but I want to see him expand his game a little bit, a lot like Matt Olson did in 2021. He had a down season in 2020. Matt Olson came out. He was an MVP candidate uh, in 2021. So that's what I want to see from Seth Brown. I know that that big of a jump, probably not going to happen, but I want to see him make some strides, maybe hit 240 with a 330 on base, something like three, let's say 315. Let's start uh, a little bit lower there. Let's, let's get him on the right track and then he can really take off in 2023. But the stats say that Seth Brown can hit four seamers because he hit 260 against them. He hit 214 overall. He hit 260 against four seamers. And so fastballs, he can hit. And he also, fastballs of a few different varieties, accounted for 13 of his 20 home runs. So fastballs are the things that uh, if you're a pitcher, don't throw them those. I know that you probably want to, but don't because he does really well against those and not very good against anything else. So the problem area for Seth this season, which again, first full season in the big leagues, he's had a couple of cups of coffee, but first full season in the big leagues were breaking balls and off-speed pitches. We see that a lot with young guys. It's breaking balls, off-speed pitches. Once they establish that they can hit a fastball, you're like, all right, well, hit, hit this slider. And then against sliders, he hit 146 and whiffed it 37.2 percent of them uh or 32 37.2 percent of the time uh so that's uh that's a plan of attack for seth brown if you're a pitcher his batting average was lower against splitters at 077 and he whiffed it way more of them consistently uh, at a 62.5 percent rate but i'm tasking seth brown with coming up with a way to hit sliders this winter uh sliders are the the, the new pitch that it feels like every pitcher has. And it, it just really helps them dominate the game. Is it, if you got a slider, you're going to be a really good pitcher in today's game. It feels like, uh, cause everybody's working on their sliders that they pair it with their fastball and you're like, ah, is it going to go straight or is it going to go like this? And once you can get the tunneling and where it's going like this, and then sometimes it keeps going straight or sometimes it goes to one side or the other slide sliders are super effective and they suck so much. Uh, cause the A's don't have a lot of pitchers with like really, really dominant sliders. And so it feels like they're a little bit behind sometimes, but oh, well, I'll talk about that on tomorrow's podcast. Um, and it feels like they could S sliders are the one that everybody has splitters are also used, but they were only used about a third of the time against him. He saw three times as many sliders as he did splitters is what I'm saying. So I want him to work on hitting sliders, even though he struggled more against splitters. I feel like if he figured out sliders, he would have more a, a bigger impact than hitting, you know, that just a few, uh, having a better approach against a few splitters is all that I'm saying there. So how does one go about hitting sliders? I have no idea. Is it go getting in the box and, 
seeing a thousand sliders a day for the for the entirety of the offseason? Maybe. I, I don't know. I legitimately don't know how you go about working on hitting a slider, which might be why uh, so many pitchers have them right now and why it's such a dominant pitch is because there's so many different types. Some of them are like cutters where they, they go just a little bit, you know, a few inches here or there. Some of them sweep from one side of the plate to the other as it's getting to the plate. So there's a lot of different kinds of movement and you got to kind of see what each pitcher is doing and get just a scouting report, I think. So maybe that could be the other thing that he has to do is get better scouting reports and just really delve into the stats and work with Sean Murphy or other catchers that he knows and get into the minds of pitchers as to when they would throw a slider. Um, th these are a couple of the options that I came up with. I don't know. I'm not Darren Bush. I'm not an elite hitting coach by any means. I, I like to focus more on pitching just because I can read those stats a little bit better and have a plan of action. Whereas uh, hitting, I'm like, I don't see it and hit it. That, that's as good as I got for you guys. So uh, I can read the stats, say that he's not hitting sliders well. I want him to hit sliders better. How does he do that? No idea. Work with Darren Bush if he's still around uh, after the end of the month because there might be some coaching changes. We will see. Um, so it, I, I, he needs to get better at hitting sliders or off-speed pitches. Or he needs to get be He needs to get better at hitting some sort of a pitch that is not a fastball. And then that is going to be a big a big thing for Seth Brown in reaching that next level, I think. And also uh, learn the strike zone a little bit better and don't swing at so many pitches because uh, he, he swung and missed a lot. And maybe it's he's swinging at uh, strikes and he, he just can't make contact. Make better contact because we need to work on that 274 on base. Uh, so that is my thing with Seth Brown. Get better at sliders. How do you do it? No idea, but do it is all I got. But uh, coming up, I've got a homework assignment for Cole Irvin because he had a really bad pitch. So we're going to talk about uh, what to do with that one really bad pitch. So stay locked in with Locked On A's and I'll be right back. Did you know the Bilt Bar has so many delicious flavors? There is something for everyone. And when you talk to a Bilt Bar fan, they're definitely passionate about their favorites. If you don't know Bilt Bars, well, you are missing out. They have coconut, cherry barcia, raspberry, mint brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel, strawberry, orange, cookies and cream, and German chocolate. My favorite flavor of these core flavors is cherry barcia. They've had some of those uh, limited time flavors. Those ones are always delicious. But of the core flavors, cherry barcia is the one that I go to. And if you haven't tried all of, all of these flavors, then you can get a mix box where you will get two of each of these nine flavors. And not only are Built Bars the best tasting, but they're also healthy too. They give you 17 to 18 grams of protein, calories from 130 to 180, only four or five grams of sugar, and only four or five grams of net carbs. They're all amazing flavors. They're all tasty. They're all healthy. And you can go and order today and get the grasshopper cookie or raspberry or whatever you'd like by going to built.com and using promo code LOCKED15. And when you do that, you will get 15% off of your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Whew, that was fun. All right. <laughs> How would, we're doing good on time. Good to see. Uh, this Cole Irvin one, it's going to be exciting. So if you are still here, uh, Cole Irvin, friend of the pod. So this is this is going to be an interesting one. I'm going to see if he wants to come on the show and uh, talk about pitching and whatnot and see what's up with his curveball. Spoiler. Good stuff. All right, but let's get back into it. Also, leave me comments. Ask me questions. What do you guys want me to talk about? Because uh, today's offseason is upon us, and I can talk about the playoffs. That's always fun. But what do you guys want to hear about? Uh, any questions that you guys have concerning the A's, leave them in the comments. I will address them. I might even make an entire episode out of them. So go ahead. Leave me your comments in – or leave me your questions in the comments, and I will answer them. It'll be a lot of fun. And uh, – Welcome to the A's offseason. Boom. We're in all green today. <laughs> all right. But let's get back into it. <clears throat> 
Welcome back to the Locked On Ace podcast. If you guys are enjoying the show, make sure to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel or wherever you like to hear podcasts. Follow us on social media at Locked On A's on Twitter and Instagram. I am at by Jason B on Twitter and in the Spotify green room app. If you guys have any questions for us, please send those to LockedOnAthletics at gmail.com. Also, coming up on tomorrow's show, I am doing a new thing called Fat Tuesday. And I will explain it in more detail tomorrow, but Fat Tuesday is when we take a look at free agents and trade options for the A's and how they can improve their team in 2022. Uh, I, I'm Tomorrow's episode, I am assuming that the A's are going to keep everybody and we're going to try and build a winner. Well, let's just say we're going to try and build a winner. We're going to address one specific thing that they need. I'm going to give you a couple of options and we're going to go over them. And then uh, you guys can let me know if you guys like those ideas. If you don't like those ideas, that is Fat Tuesday in a nutshell. And we'll be rotating from position to position to see what the A's need and who they can go out and get. It'll be it'll be a process. It'll probably last a couple of months. It'll be a lot of fun. So uh, make sure to tune in on Fat Tuesday and also on Wednesday uh MLB Trade Rumors just released their arbitration estimates for all of the teams. So they got their A's guys and what they think that the A's players will be making in 2022, according to arbitration. So I'm going to be going over a little bit of payroll stuff. So that'll be fun for Wednesday. So make sure to subscribe, uh, follow us on YouTube, do all the things that you need to do to make sure that you hear those two episodes and all of the episodes, because we are here for you guys each and every day. But finally, I am turning to friend of the pod, Cole Irvin. Cole's a pretty solid pickup for the A's in 2021. He had a better than league average 424 ERA, and he made 32 starts and threw 178 in the third innings. Those are really, really good numbers. I will take that from a fifth starter that, you know, just made the rotation out of, not out of nowhere, but he was in it until the very end, and then he was put in the fifth spot as, you know, just a Mike Fires is hurt. He gets a couple of starts and then he just stayed in the rotation the entire season. Was he great all the time? No, but he was consistent for the is. And that's what I, that's, I appreciate that. I will say that I appreciate that. The one thing that I noticed in looking at some of the worst pitches in baseball, though, in terms of run value was that Cole Irvin's curveball was not great of the nearly 2,400 different pitches thrown by pitchers by all pitchers. So you got, you know, five pitches or five pitch types from like Chris Bassett or, you know, th this many from uh, Manaya. You take all of those pitches from all of the pitchers, you get about 2,400 pitches. Um, you, you got his curveball, uh, Cole Irvin's curveball. You got Frankie Splitter, Manaya Sinker. Um, it, of all of these pitches, Cole Irvin's curveball ranked 2,359th out of a possible 2,000. 385 pitches. He was towards the bottom with that curveball. It was not good. The good news here is that he only throws his curveball 3.2% of the time. And my guess is that it's used as a sneak attack pitch uh, because he knows that it's not terribly effective, but because he doesn't have a lot of velocity or he's a, he's a pinpoint guy. He has to keep guys off of his pitches and keep them guessing as to what's coming next. That's why I think that he has that curveball. So that's going to make the next part a little bit interesting, but that's what I think. The bad news, that's the good news, is I think that it's a sneak pitch and he didn't use it a lot. But the bad news is that the sneak attack was not working, and that is why we are talking about it. Irvin's curveball had an expected batting average of 407 and a hard hit percentage of 60.9. Those are not great stats. The curve is Irvin's fifth pitch along with his four-seamer, uh, he has a sinker, a curve, and a, or sorry, a changeup and a slider. Of the 87 curveballs that he threw in 2021, four of them were hit for home runs. So if you look at that as you know a start of curveballs or just uh, an outing where you're throwing roughly 100 pitches, he gave up four home runs. Is how I'm taking that. It's not a good percentage, and they had an average exit velocity of 94.1 on average, which is a hard hit ball. Almost on average, a hard hit ball is 95 miles an hour. He was allowing 94.1. That is a bad average to have right there. And that's why when I talk about pitchers and they have a max exit velocity and they're like uh, down in the first percentile because they allowed one ball that was hit like 116, but their average exit velocity is actually really good. I'm okay with that. 
honestly, I, I, I'm okay with the average exit velocity. That's like in the, I'm going to say 80th percentile, but their uh, max exit velocity is down. It's because they gave up one bad pitch. I am more interested in average than max. And that is why that 94.1 is a little bit terrifying. So my plan for Cole Irvin would go one of two ways. One, either eliminate the pitch altogether, which would take the pitch completely out of his stat line. And that's four home runs that he didn't give up. All of a sudden, he's probably got like an under four ERA. That's really good. The downside is that Cole isn't an overpowering pitcher. And having it there, even if it's not a great pitch, is something extra that the hitter has to think about. One well-timed curve can keep hitters off of a sinker or his changeup on the next pitch. And if you can just get it by, it doesn't have to be a strike pitch. It doesn't have to, but just something else to get them thinking like, oh, what was it? it? Just changing their eye levels a little bit. That is something. And also it's the slowest pitch. It comes out in like 74, I believe. Um, that is also an added value of throwing his curveball. The second option, which would be get a different fifth pitch. The downside here, just get a different fit pitch. <laughs> That's easy to say from my standpoint. Uh, the downside here is that he'd be relying on a pitch that he doesn't have a lot of familiarity with and learning to trust it, that he could throw it for strikes could take some time. And he needs to be able to throw it for strikes because he is a strike thrower. He hits his spots. That is his whole game. But the upside is that he would it would give him another look in the eyes of batters and make him just a, a touch more harder more harder uh, to prepare for. So th there's a few different ways that it could go. And I don't know which way is the correct way. It would be up to Cole Irvin and maybe he'll come on and uh, let me know. But in terms of which pitch, if he was going to get a new fifth pitch, I'd say a cutter would be a decent option. Um, and I, I, there's a couple of thoughts on this one too, but since the curve was thrown mostly to righties and he is a lefty, a cutter would work in on the hands of a right-handed batter or at least get off of the barrel of right-handers. He could also throw it on the outside edge and you know steal some strikes that way too, but maybe they could just flick it the other way. The Astros would definitely try and flick that the other way. But it would be a nice get-off-the-barrel type pitch if they're not expecting it and they're expecting more of a heater. Um, again, there is one concern, and that is with Cole Irvin being a location pitcher and not a velocity guy, keeping guys off of his four other pitchers and changing speeds on them is what helped him have success. Replacing his curve, which averaged 76.9 miles per hour, I was wrong, 76.9 miles per hour, and working in a cutter, which makes sense movement-wise, but may not offer enough differentiation between his fastball and his slider in terms of velocity. So if he's throwing one that's 91 and one that's 88 and then another one that's 88, that's three pitches that are basically the same. They have a little bit different movement, but is he getting enough different kinds of movement to make it really an effective pitch? That is something to actually consider. So um, so maybe the best plan of action is to hang on to the curveball and make it a better pitch. Chris Bassett has a pretty good curveball. Um, his average is 71 miles per hour, so it's a very nice, slow, looping curveball and had an expected batting average against of 164 this season. Um, so the plan of action could be get that grip from Seabass and work on having his curveball. The other option, or the other uh, downside of that one is they have different arm angles. Chris Bassett is more over the top, whereas uh, Cole Irvin comes a little bit more from the side. They're obviously righty-lefty differences. Um, so would it work? I I don't think so, but hey, see if, it, see if it does. Maybe he already tried. I don't know, but I want him to figure out what to do with that curveball. I either want it to be more effective or eliminated or get a new fifth pitch. Uh, something else. I don't know what the answer is, but it's something because that pitch was absolutely terrible for him in 2021. And he would have been a, a slightly better pitcher. He was already better than league average. He would have been almost as good statistically as Manaya and maybe not quite Manaya. Let's just say Manaya, who had like a 390 ERA. They would have been the same. That would have been great. I would have taken that. Give me Cole Irvin being as good as Sean Manaya, and I will be very, very happy. So there you guys have it. Three homework assignments for the A's players this winter that could help make them just a little bit better on those margins. Because with the A's, it's always about the margins. And these are achievable ways to help improve the overall club. This is just what I saw. And uh, I like it. If I'm being honest, I think that these are decent ideas. Do, do I have the plan of action for them? No, but I picked apart what they needed to improve upon. And 
I'm, I'm happy with that. So uh, that is all that I got for you guys today. And thank you so much for making a Locked On A's your first lesson every day. Now make your second lesson Locked On MLB with Sully, where he brings his unique perspective on the major leagues, both past and present. It's free and available on all platforms. But that's all that I got for you guys today. So until next time, uh, go out and celebrate good times, Oakland, and I will talk at you tomorrow.